So I, you know, full disclosure, I, you know, I'm a fan. Oh, hello. You know, I have been. This know. is the opposite of British television. Being right. a fan would have disqualified you. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but the problem is it's hard not to find a fan, right? I mean, you go back, Python, Faulty, yeah, Wanda. You, but you never know, you see, because uh, first of all, everyone's always nice to you. Um, and secondly, the people who come to my shows now are my one-man show. It's not like 40 years ago when I didn't know if they'd like what I was doing. The audiences now don't say, I hate Cleese, let's buy six tickets. They, they like me. Right. So when I come out, there's warmth, and they're likely to enjoy the kind of jokes that I make. You see what I mean? So life seems to get uh, But do, does that mean there's no challenge in it anymore? Mm -hmm. No, because I still want to do the best show I can, and that's genuine. Well, I want to talk about But I don't get as scared as I used to. You get scared? I used to get very. I used to have the worst nerves in the world. Stage fright. Stage fright. Well, there's a little bit about it yeah. in the book, right? You remember about the first television? But it's so television? hard to believe when you watch somebody like you that there was ever that period. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, every time I did a Monty Python show, I used to think afterwards, I wish they'd take the dress rehearsal. Because on the dress rehearsal, I was loose. And every time we went to make the show in front of the audience, I could feel myself tighten up. And my timing wasn't quite as good. I wish to make it complete. <laughs> Sorry, we're closing for lunch. Never mind that, my lad. I wish to complain about this parrot what I purchased not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Oh, yes, the Norwegian blue. What's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. <laughs> the beauty of this book and, and the speeches that I've watched you give and watched them on YouTube is it's kind of like taking a, a master class in, in writing, oh, in, in humor, in comedy. And so I want to try and pull a, a few things out. From that, but before I go there, what is it you have against celery? Ah, uh, the taste. I mean, I have no sort of prejudice against it. It could be just this is not a sort of anti-vegetable thing like anti, you know, racism or something like that. It just, I, 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 it's, I don't know why anybody would eat it for pleasure. It's like that line in uh, in the crunchy frog chocolate sketch when when he describes a, a chocolate called Spring Surprise and, and, and he tells the hygiene squad that when you bite into it, steel bolts leap out and lacerate your <laughs> cheeks and the, and the hygiene squad guy says, well, where's the pleasure in that? And that's what I feel about when I see people eating celery. It just makes no sense to me. You know, there are people who dress up in latex rubber in order to become sexually excited. I don't get that either. No. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> That's a rather long answer. But I think, oh, maybe I should just have said I don't like the taste. But what, 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 why are you part of the Canadian Celery Protection Association? No, no, no. I, just, I just found it interesting when you kind of listed the things that you don't want ever to pass your lips. <laughs> the, the first one was celery. Yes, that's right. That's the word. Which seems like such an innocent vegetable. Well, it is. It's not responsible. I'm not sort of saying, let's blame celery. You know, let's pull celery up and uh, beat them into shape. Or No, no, I, I just... Uh, the other thing is limpets. I had limpets once in Greece, and I don't like those. But everything else I, I enjoy, especially, and I'm ashamed to say this, dog. Now, I've had dog in Hong Kong. I didn't know it was dog at the time. Uh, but when I said to the guy afterwards who bought me lunch, I said, well, that was particularly delicious. <laughs> what was it? He said, it's dog. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's a sort of poodle. And the embarrassing thing was that it was so delicious. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I didn't know whether to go away and throw up out of sympathy for the poor creature or what. But the next day when I was walking along the street, I saw a poodle coming towards me. And you know those little feelings you sometimes get back there, like little prickles of, 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 of almost of discomfort that come when the salivary glands start to, to, start to fly. I thought, I have to stop this straight away. You know, it, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, I mean, there, there are definitely countries in the, in, in the Far East that, that the dog is a delicacy. The dog's a I delicacy. I can remember being in Korea with fettuccine El Fido on, <laughs> on, on the menu. But. <laughs> Here's the reason I asked you the, the celery question, the real celery, reason. Yeah. The real reason I asked you is because, you know, 
how hard is it to be funny? Because asking you a question like that, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something funny coming back, and, right, right. and I got it. And, and, and you must feel some pressure every time anybody comes up to you, whether it's in an airport or a hotel lobby or A little bit, but it's, just, it's not like it used to be. I used to feel the pressure much more. Now I just kind of, I just chat, you know, and that's usually good enough. I think being very funny is very difficult. And uh, as you might remember in the book, I say that I always wanted to be as funny as possible, not clever. I thought clever was relatively easy. I knew a lot of comedians who were clever, and they didn't strike me as being very funny. But I used to love to laugh uncontrollably. And there was a certain type of comedy that just, just made me crack up until it hurt. And that's what I wanted to do when I was entertaining people. All the time it was my fault. Oh, it's so obvious now. I've seen the light. Well, I must be punished then, mustn't I? You're a naughty boy. You talk often, and you mention in the book, that the, the power of humor is, in many ways, underestimated. People don't understand yeah, yes, I think the value right. of humor. No, they don't. I think that's right. And it's all, you see how few awards go in the Oscars, for example, to, to, to comedy. It's, it's regarded as second best, but as Jonathan Miller once said to me, it was good enough for Mozart, it was good enough for Shakespeare, so it's good enough for me. I think it's immensely powerful. Whether it changes things very much, I'm not sure, but what I do know is the one thing that people in power can't abide is being made fun of. I have been talking with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler, and I have in my hand a piece of shit. Cut it. Nibble. And I think this wonderful thing about humor is that it punctures pomposity. If, if people are very self-important, they love to have a slightly solemn atmosphere around them because they know that any kind of humor is going to deflate that pomposity. So I think it's very important for that reason. I once interviewed, believe it or not, the Dalai Lama, and I asked him about that, and he said, what I love about people laughing is that, there's, that they can begin to change their mind. I think when we're anxious, we hang on to our opinions and defend them to the death. And when we're relaxed and laughing, we can listen to another point of view and think, oh, that's interesting, or, you know? So I think it's got a lot of useful uh, aspects. You know, I think John Stewart and Stephen Colbert did more to get Obama elected than almost anyone else because they put the news into entertaining terms. There was humor, but there was more than humor. Uh, you know, humor can be spread across a great spectrum. It, it can be very nasty humor, where you go after racial groups, or there can be very inclusive humor. Inclusive joke, for example, is how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Now, I think that's a sweet joke. And it connects everyone, because everybody has that feeling. You, you make, it never goes right, you know? So that's an inclusive kind of joke. <laughs> Obama's an interesting character for a lot of different reasons, but he's also a tall guy with very long legs. Do you think he could do the silly walk? He probably could at the beginning of his presidency, but I would think it was doubtful whether he could do it now. Uh, the way that job grinds people down is just tragic. Can you still do the walk? No. First of all, I'm 75. Second, I have an artificial knee and an artificial hip. Thirdly, I am bored to death with it. <laughs> You talk about that, too, yeah. in the sense that old I never jokes... thought it was as funny as everyone else did. Oh, it's hilarious. And it's still hilarious for us to watch it. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I just... It never appealed to me. But the whole point about being in my business... I mean, really... it's, on, it's on your book. It's a picture on your oh, book. Oh, of course you, it is. You, you can't look at it I tell you, the smiling. day I die, that will be on the television. John Cleese, there will be pictures of me silly walking along. And the British press will say, Basil's faulty heart because they cannot resist a cliche. You know? 
I'm stuck with those things. But at least I can tell you, uh, I never thought it was that funny. And when I used to do it on stage, there was all this laughter when I was doing it with Michael Palin. Michael wrote it with Terry Jones and I, I gave up the dialogue because the audience were laughing so much. And I would say to Michael, this sketch is not as funny as everyone thinks. And you'll notice it's the brilliance of my performance. <laughs> Everybody loved it. I'm almost out of time. Um, I could go on. Well, let's go on. Time. I don't know. Somebody will come in and say, I've got to go somewhere yeah. else and do an interview with somebody rather less interesting. So why don't we just keep it going? <laughs>